Good morning. We're glad to have you here with us today. And we also want to always remember to welcome our online audience. I don't know if you know this or not, but we average about 150 people that worship with us online. It's almost like another uh, worship service that we have. So we want to welcome those of you that might be uh, on live streaming with us now. If you happen to have dropped in on us uh, today, you're right in the middle of a series that we're talking about, I want a new marriage. And um, we've had lots of fun and laughter in some of the other messages. Today's a heavy, and it's a little bit different than uh, what we have been uh, talking about as we talk about love busters today. And it's, uh, it's been different uh, preparing this week and, and thinking about these things and going through the surveys that we had in our uh, church. Over 400 of our uh, people answered various questions, and I'll share some of the results through this message. And uh, I'm not here today to say that the three that we picked out are the top three love busters, but they are uh, they're in the top ten of anybody's list. Uh, that would come out. We noticed that they came up uh, numerous times in our own surveys, but they were adultery, addiction, and abuse. And I'm going to deal with those in reverse order uh, when I start to talk with them. Immediately we begin to think, well, you know, is, or do we have those kind of issues in the church and everything? Well, obviously we do. And, and it's uh, across the, the bounds in the, in the culture, and it's going to be in the church too. I remember in another church that I was in, I had a friend uh, whose name was Jim. We were pretty good friends, in fact. And uh, from time to time, his wife would come to church with a black eye. And she would do what I have observed through the years, uh, many women might do if, if they remain in public, is to do the makeup thing on the eyes the best you can and uh, wear sunglasses. And that's what she did. And so, you know, what's happened, what's going on, and not much information. And uh, as I begin to discover a, a little bit more, one time I was, just, I was just talking with him, you know, basically about his drinking. I was just asking him, are you an alcoholic? And, I mean, that wasn't the first question I um, brought up, but, you know, give all the sensitivity and then to the bottom line. And he says, no, I just drink beer. And that was one of my first uh, learning that sometimes people think if they drink just beer, they can't be an alcoholic. And he said, um, I come home at the end of the day, and I drink six beers, you know, the evening time while I'm sitting down. I'm sitting there. Now, you know, I don't drink beer. I don't know about beer. I don't know about all that. But I love Diet Dr. Peppers. <laughs> and I can drink a 20-ounce bottle, and I'm done for the night, okay? Uh, in more ways than one. But, uh, so how somebody can sit down and, and drink six of them, I, I don't know, but that's what he was doing. So he was in denial, first of all, about what was going on in his life. But then after he had gone through the, uh, the little drinking episode, then he would become abusive to his wife. And so those are the kind of issues that are in our midst, and those are the kinds of things that break marriages up if they are not dealt with. The things that we'll talk about today are love busters. They destroy not only the marriage relationships, they destroy any relationships. If you're here and you're not married, all this applies to you. It applies to everything and how we relate to, to one another. It'll destroy any relationship that you have with people. So I'm going to go in reverse order with these and talk about them first. Our first love buster is abuse. And marriage abuses, whether they're from the husband or the wife, and they can be from either side. It's a big concern for many couples, which can be physical abuse, can be psychological abuse. It can be emotional abuses. They come in different forms. They vary from couple to couple, and they vary from family to family. But a short list might include things like telling a, a spouse that they're unwanted or telling them that they are uh, the kinds of things that are demeaning kinds of things that tear down uh, someone's self-esteem and uh, image. Uh, physical abuse, of course, in, in whatever form that that may occur in hitting or, or beating, uh, name-calling, 
Uh, ignoring the spouse. You get into control issues that might be restricting a person to a room or emotional or, phys or uh, emotional terrorizing, monitoring of uh, phone calls or uh, making a spouse do something that they are not comfortable with. So ab abuse is one of the most common reasons for divorce. And if you're seeing that, in your home, this is something that needs to be dealt with immediately. It's important for any person who's facing any form of an abuse to seek immediate, uh, I would say, Christian professional help. Every 10 to 15 seconds in the United States, a woman is battered by her husband or boyfriend. Three to four women die every day in the United States at the hand of their husband or boyfriend. Husbands usually is abusing physically. The wife is usually verbally. But you know one of the things we've learned in our series is that marriage is a covenant that we make first to God and then we make to each other that we're going to be helpers for each other. But that our covenant is to love in unconditional love, to love as Christ loved the church, to love each other and to help one another, and to bless one another, and encourage one another. When we get into this kind of behavior that we're talking about now, this when it happens in a relationship, little by little you're tearing down the sense of esteem and worth and value of a human being. And if you use the metaphor that I've used uh, before, you may not have, I may not have been in here with the message I did, but the love bank where you're making withdrawals and deposits and you're trying not to become overdrawn in the marriage relationship. Uh, what we're talking about today, these kind of things withdraw uh, huge amounts. Ephesians 4.29 Paul says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Do not let any unwholesome talk. As I was looking through some other translations, the New Revised Standard Version said, do not let any evil talk. Uh, come out of your mouth, only that that builds up. The word for that means putrefy. If I were to give you a word picture, uh, I don't know if you keep leftovers or not, but we do leftovers, and sometimes you put the leftovers in there. I don't say we always eat them, but we keep them. <laughs> if, I don't know if you've ever noticed it, but sometimes they get accidentally, you know, pushed onto the back of the uh, refrigerator, so... Two or three weeks, maybe you pull it out, and, you know, it's got this terrible odor. Plus, it has liquefied, so that therefore you don't even know what it was when you first put it in again. And so, Paul is saying, do not let this kind of stuff come out of your mouth. Jesus had a conversation about that with the people. He said, look, you're all concerned about what's clean, what's unclean. What's coming into your mouth? He said, you need to be concerned about what's coming out of your mouth because out of the mouth comes from the overflow of the heart. You want to know what's in you? Just pay attention to what's coming out. You know, if we took the, um, hmm, <laughs> wonder where the offering plates are. <laughs> if we took the offering plates and... Uh, <laughs> for the offering during the uh, communion. Uh, if you shake the offering plate, what comes out? The offering, because that's what's in it. You know, if you shake one of our trash cans around here, what's going to come out? Trash, because that's what's in it. So when we get shaken, whether it's in stress or anger or whatever happens, what comes out is what's in. So we see in Jesus and what comes out is very important because that's about your heart. Paul, also in this scripture on Ephesians Last week, we talked about the roles. And we talked about how it said men are the head of the wife, 
but there's not a period there. It goes on to explain a whole lot of explanation about how they're to love as Christ loved the church. And, and then it says, wives, submit to your husband, but there's not a period there. It goes on to explain, you know, as, Christ, as the church does to the, to the uh, Christ and those kinds of things. And what has happened? Because we've not had a good holistic uh, understanding of this. We've got the caricature that the world puts onto that. And then you've got those of us in the church and some churches who, who have been lazy in trying to explain and help see that, that it talks about a mutual submission, wives to the husbands, and, and all these other uh, explanation points that are on there. What has happened, and I, and I think unwittingly, it has enabled men to subjugate to, if you will, at times lead to abusive relationships because this verse is out of context. They use it out of context, and the man thinks he has the ability and the right to control his wife, that she somehow or another belongs to him. And it's the antithesis of what Paul was trying to say. And unfortunately, the church, some churches have uh, been unwittingly leaning to that and doing that. And sometimes people stay in abusive relationships because they think they're fulfilling the law of Christ by doing that. God, the Scripture says, hates divorce, and he does. But I think there's some things that God hates also as much, if not more, than divorce. And this may be very well one of those. I want to say and encourage you today, if you might be in an abusive relationship that you seek help. Uh, we've tried to, people have asked for resources, and on the back of your bulletin day, we've tried to list a whole number of resources. And this just leads me to say, I hope that you understand the approach that we're taking here is not to condemn or be judgmental about it, but to say, hey, we're here to walk with you through it. We're here to help. We want to help you. I, my chains fell off. My heart is free. I mean, we sing all this. We sing about this freedom. And yet in reality, many times we don't experience it, and we need help with others. And we're here to help you, and we want to help you do that. We have a, I just point out the counseling ministry. Uh, Leonard Goldman is one of our counselors, and Deanna Eddy is one of our counselors, and Ed Chandler. We have male and female counselors. If you thought you were being abused, let me encourage you to come. Come to the church and let someone walk with you through that. I also would like to say if you think you might be an abuser or you see yourself moving toward that, the same would be come. Come to them. Come and walk. Let someone walk with you and help. That's our pledge to you, is to help you and to walk through, through this and to get out of it. Our second love buster is addiction. And marriages and families and drug addiction certainly doesn't mix well. An addict not only has degrading effects on their own self-image, not only are you being destroyed personally, but you're doing it to the spouses and the most disastrous emotional scars oftentimes go to the children, close relatives, and friends. If a solution to save a marriage from addiction is not provided, addiction turns everything towards destruction. And the more it continues, the more destructive it gets. It's not one of those things that gets better with time. It gets worse with time. One of the ministries in our church that I am so excited that we began years ago was Celebrate Recovery. You know, I appreciate all the great things that AA has done, and uh, almost every church I've been in has had an AA group uh, meeting in there. But one of the things that they do to make it appealing, I guess, to the wide variety of the world is in the 12 steps, they talk about a higher power. And I love the 12 step ministry and the, the, the program and the effectiveness that it can have. But I always wanted to have a ministry in the church that I was in that named the higher power. So in Celebrate Recovery and in our recovery ministry, we name him. He's Jesus. 
You know, and, and what a difference that that can make. And we talk about if you have hurts or habits or hang-up, and certainly addictions fall in that matter, fall in that, that area. You know, to invite you to come and, and be involved and, and begin to, to get started with breaking out of this. Addictions are an unusual thing because it usually starts with something that's pleasurable, you know, either physiologically or, or emotionally, and but you long to have more of it. So you begin to overindulge in it, and it begins to affect our capacity to live lives the way God wants us to live. And it becomes an addiction. Even though you've overindulged in it, you need more and more and more until we no longer control the substance, but the substance controls you or whatever it is. Alcohol is the most prominent. There's also drugs, gambling. In fact, you got any number of things. You got o over, you see the word over and then something else on it, like over eaters anonymous, over whatever. I anything can become that addiction, and we need help with it. The impact of addiction is that it hurts the people. God is entrusted to our care. It marks them. And there's hope. Because Christ has set us free. One major one is pornography. It can become an addiction. When children see this, it becomes their understanding of what sexual intimacy looks like. And it's a false picture. When you look at pornography, it becomes another addiction because it's human nature to want to see these more, more of these images. In our survey, we ask, how often, or have you, yeah, how often do you view pornography? And the answers were basically never, sometimes frequently. And the biggest answer, uh, not everybody answered every question, but 99 men answered the question in our survey of those that took it. And 42.4% said sometimes. Um, on frequently, 2%. I'm not sure if that speaks for all everybody. I'm not sure if everybody was honest. I have no idea about any of that. I just the reports, the results of it. My guess would be that might be low. Uh, we have an, a significant problem in our culture, and it's going to get worse. It's out of control because now through your cell phones or whatever you give to a young child, 10 years old, 11 year old, a boy, he's defenseless. He's just about defenseless. And it's going to mark our society in ways that I don't think we have any ideas of knowing. Women, 248 women answered this question. And 7.3% said sometimes. So basically what I see here in this is, is that women are somewhat of an issue, but this is a huge male issue that is going on here. And there are reasons for you to choose not to look. There are good reasons to say, I am not going to go back to that. I am not going to look at that. One is just how we dehumanize and objectify women in pornography. It's a false picture of sexual intimacy. And then just the whole issue of addiction. If you're not careful, it, it produces a chemical reaction in the brain. And what happens is, you know, is that God has created us to bond with another person, to become one flesh. And there's a chemical reaction in, blame, in the brain when you're involved uh, sexually with, with your spouse. And that, that chemical reaction is positive and good because it bonds you and it makes you want to come back to that person so you bond to that person. When you view pornography, the same chemicals are released. <laughs> but you're not bonding to your spouse. You're not bond bonding to another person. Now you're bonding to the pornography. And there's in what creates the addiction. And after a while, it's not enough uh, you've got to find something more deviant, you got, and you become more desensitized, 
And the time comes when it's not enough to look at it online. You have to try it, and you've become a slave to it. It increases the likelihood of divorce. You lose your ability to be close to women. It's a craving that can't be satisfied. It could go on and on with good reasons to say no. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says it's God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. The word there for sexual immorality is porneo, where we get the word pornography from that Paul talks about. The good news is, is that God can set us free, that his grace and his power can keep us from becoming slaves. And I pray if you're walking down that road, that you will get help, that you will stop if you can, if you're in the addiction cycle, to come to us and to say, I need help. Come to celebrate recovery. Come to one of our counselors. Start saying, I want to do something about it because it's a love buster. I wish I could preach the entire message on the myth that says, our culture tells us, we can sit in our room and do what I want, and what's between me and the computer has no impact on anybody else. That is a lie straight from hell. It has an impact on everybody else because of what it does to you and the behavior that it generates in you. Then thirdly, the third love buster is adultery. The number one reason for divorce in 150 cultures around the world God says, you shall become one flesh. And he says that this is so hideous, this is so terrible, a breach of the covenant, that it breaks that bond. And God says, you're free to go. You're free to go. He doesn't say you have to go. And Initially, my, my thoughts are if you can work that out and settle that and do that and find forgiveness, that that is a positive, good thing to stay together. But if you can out, God says, this is, this is something so horrendous. But it's an issue that's faced everywhere, faced by everybody. You know, it's like the, I mean, there's a reason God put, thou shalt not commit adultery in the Ten Commandments. I heard the story about when Moses came down to the people off the mountain. He said, I've got good news and I've got bad news. And the good news is, I got him down to ten. And the bad news, adultery's still on the list. It's something that we've got to realize and face. It's something we've got to realize uh, that we recognize up front there's a challenge here to shut off all other options once we say I'll be faithful to him, to her alone because the challenge is, as human beings, we're wired to be attracted to other people. I mean, sometimes we have the idea that there's only one person in the whole world that you'll ever have this attraction for. And that's not necessarily so. As human beings, you're going to feel this attraction multiple times in our lives in different circumstances and different situations. And, you know, maybe you've been married for 10 years and suddenly you, you see this other person and there's this uh, there's attraction and there's this chemistry and, and you think, oh, no, I've married the wrong person. No. That's, that's just part of, of what is going on. I mean, having those feelings from time to time is not abnormal. It's not a sign that God wants you to get divorced and go and marry this other por- person. Now, what would happen? You divorce this person, go marry that person. Then what happens when you see the next one? It's better to build boundaries and borders and recognize that it's common from time to time in situations and circumstances. We, we've been wired to be attracted to people. How do we build the borders and boundaries around us? In in our survey, one of the questions that we ask is, have you been unfaithful to your spouse? And we had 106 men to respond to that question, and 24% said yes, that they had been unfaithful. 77% said no. 259 women answered that question, and 7% of the 259 said yes, and 93% said no. 
A University of Chicago study, this University of Chicago, this is not a church or denomination, University of Chicago study showed that there was a correlation between religious attendance and infidelity. The more often someone attended church, the less likely they were to be involved uh, in an affair. 25% who never went to church had affairs. 20% of people who attended church less than monthly had affairs. 17% from those that more than monthly and 12% for those who attend weekly. Well, I appreciate the fact that it's going down. Why would that be? Would it not be possible that when we come to church, we're reminded of truths like today? It comes to our mind, yes, this is a love buster. This is a thing that breaks up a relationship. This is a thing, and, and, and suddenly our, our priorities get back right. We get things back on track. You know, we worship together. We remind ourselves of God, of who we are, what we're called to be. That's an effective deterrent for all of us in all areas of life. That's why God said every seven days you need to stop and remind yourself that there is a God. And that's what this is about. Every seven days, you may not have thought about it the other time, but he built it in to our makeup. He built it in to everything that on the seventh day you need to stop and remember and recognize some things. And then I think we need to put in rules and, and borders and things. I remember some years ago when Hillary Clinton asked Billy Graham to have lunch with her. And he agreed as long as she brought a friend now, he was 80 years old when that happened. And the media just took it and made fun of him and made fun of it. But that was a rule. That was a rule that he had put in, in place. His ministry that he was never going to be alone with another woman. And it worked for him when it was 30. And it was just a rule still at 80. And my guess would be at 90. You see, he built a hedge around his relationship. The last word is that there's always hope, that you would walk out of here with hope. God knows we struggle. He sent Jesus to save us from ourselves. He can set the captive free. And the most important thing we can do is to just daily put our trust in Jesus and live for him. Let us pray. Father. Help us as we go through this thing called marriage and relationships that we have to realize that there are some things that destroy us. And help us, Lord, help us to know that here in this church that there's a place of love and help and caring and acceptance, that there's a throne of grace that we can come to and that we're here to help. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to our message today. I hope that you've been inspired to act upon what you've just heard and become a doer of the Word. Feel free to contact us through the information on the screen or through our website. Better yet, if you're ever in the Niceville, Florida area, feel free to stop by and visit us at the Niceville United Methodist Church.